Are sharing? Not yet. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I'm sharing now. Okay. So the prompt, um, we're gonna use the chat um, for uh, responding to questions during the lecture. So there's not a specific single question for use in the chat. It's more use the chat for all the questions that we ask during the lecture. Um, and to get to the chat, um, you can uh, go to Brightspace. So to go to Brightspace, um, let's say you're just in, you just open your browser and you're in wherever you are. Um, I'm imagining that we type something in like brightspace.com. What does that do? Nothing. That's not what we want. So let's imagine that we type in wentworth.brightspace.com. Okay. So Type in wentworthbrightspace.com. Wentworth.brightspace.com. We're, we're seeing your screen right now. Is that right? Yeah. So oh, you should. Do you see my screen? I am sharing yours. We are sharing your screen, right? You are sharing with us. Yeah. So we, we I'm, can. I'm showing everyone how to get to the chat. Okay. Okay. And then when you get to this, you should see something more like this, where you have a bunch of courses. Um, the mm -hmm. one we care about is Urbanism, Arch, 3,700 sections, five and six. And so click okay. on that. Okay. And we see this analysis okay. image of the highway and the housing and the informal title of the course is City 21. And we throw that in at the end of every file name we submit. We go down, uh, we scroll down as needed to the, the content browser and click on 11 Anthropocene. 11 Anthropocene, this is week 11. Remember, we're doing the course backwards. Uh, it's George Costanza Day here in City 21, uh, doing it chronologically from the dawn of time until the present uh, didn't work out so well. The planet is in crisis, so we're going to do the opposite of what um, has been done previously. We're going to start in the future and go back. And so uh, this week, starting on our week, start on Friday. So welcome to week 11 of the course. Week 11, the theme is the Anthropocene. And so you click, uh, you either click on the little uh, arrow or just click right on Anthropocene. And now you get the different elements of the course. And there's the analysis assignment, there's the reading, uh, there are the slides that we're showing you. There's examples from uh, 2018. I should put in some things in there, maybe. Um, and you probably don't see this 11 lecture from City 20, but you should see 11 chat. And we're looking at, we're seeing 11 lecture as well, Robert. Yeah, you see it because you're the instructor. You, oh, you, okay, get, okay. you get to look under okay, the bar. Good. <laughs> The students get to see the dashboard. Okay, they don't okay. get to see the 11 lecture. So you okay. click on that, 11 chat. So is this working? Everybody has equal access mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the tools of the course now. And when you click on 11 chat, it'll be completely empty because of course no one, oh, oh my goodness. Mm. Look at all of this activity. Thank you so much, everyone. Mm. The participation is greatly appreciated. And so um, 
we're already seeing questions. And now this is a resource um, that Manuel and I can access to fine tune the lecture to make sure that we are satisfying the needs as best we can. No promises. Um, these are some very demanding uh, provocations here that you're, and they should be. If, if you're paying attention, then you should be a little pissed off, a little bit. And that emotion is a healthy thing. Um, that emotion is what prevents us from just sitting back and relaxing and saying, okay, teachers, uh, I am passively going to receive your wisdom. No, you have to grab whatever you can get out of this uh, course, okay? So this is, this is your job. This is your job of demanding more than we're giving you. Please demand more from us. Grab what you can out of us. Uh, we're really, we're the best there is. We're really good at doing this, but we are not nearly good enough given the challenges that you are facing in your careers. And if you're paying attention, you should be a little pissed off. And you should be pissed off in a productive way that inspires you to demand more from us, to demand more from your school, to demand more from, your edu uh, from what we are offering you. Demand more from this course, starting with demanding more from this lecture. So I'll be looking at this uh, while Manuel is presenting. Uh, and Manuel, well, let's hope we'll be looking at it while I'm presenting. And we will do our best to rise to the challenges you are throwing at us. In the meantime, uh, there are gonna be, so this is just the first of a minimum of three. So this is the first contribution you're making. We want every single one of you to have your cameras on so we can see you nod yes and no. And we want you to ask questions along the way, throw questions into that chat and uh, uh, provoke, hopefully it will provoke a response uh, from your humble professors, okay? So you'll recognize this slide and you'll recognize the title the first lecture of this course is a repeat of the last lecture of the last course, right? We're gonna go a little bit more deeply into Caracas and a few other things uh, because we just didn't have the time last summer. But really uh, what we do this semester is informed by the challenges that you face during your lifetimes and your careers. And if it's not, then why don't you just quit school? Because what's the point, right? If your school is not helping you succeed in life, then um, why stay in school as the rap singer? I don't know his name. Someone put that in the chat. I'm gonna move this over here. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, we're hoping that this is not a passive experience, but a, um, a, uh, an active engagement um, as best we can with the tools we have, uh, given that the class has 45 students in it. So uh, you're already in the process of putting in your first questions. Thank you very much. Um, but during the course of this lecture, we want each and every one of you, we expect you to ask or, or comment at least two additional times, um, a minimum of two. If you want to comment on every slide that we put up, um, I guess that's okay. Although we hope that you uh, leave some space for your classmates there. I don't think we're gonna run out of space in the digital tools, but um, is that clear to everyone? Uh, so by the end of class today, there should be three uh, things in this chat on Brightspace uh, tagged with your name. Any questions about that? Thank you, Carrington, for helping us navigate things. Um,
And uh, if, if you're still having trouble by the end of class, just hang back. Uh, we'll dismiss everyone and then we can- I, uh, um, Can I share my screen for a second? Yes, please do. Okay. <laughs> Uh, give me just go screen. ahead and click on share screen. Okay. Yes. And thank you so much. You you are the official TA. Okay. So I don't know if you can see my screen now, but um, so you get to this point, you just click on urbanism down here. Um, this is the home screen. You just scroll all the way down. You see these numbers down here. Just click this little thing here. And then mm -hmm. if you want to get to the chat, just click this and it'll point you to the chat. Wait, click what? Sorry. Okay, I'm going to go back. <laughs> okay, so once you're up the top, you just scroll down. You see like 11 and 12, go to 11. Mm -hmm. And then you see chat and just click that. And then there you go. You should be okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Our hero, thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, don't say sorry. Say so you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> All right. So now we know who to turn to when uh, we're not understanding one of the systems. Okay. I'll be asked, Manuel and I will be asking you questions as well. Sure. Okay. We have malfunction here. Hopefully, I don't have to restart my laptop. So this slideshow also happens to be available uh, to, I think it's available to everyone here in the same place. All roads um, start at Brightspace, okay? So when I ran into trouble, I, I went back to Brightspace and uh, we're back in business. Okay. Good. So because uh, you've seen this lecture before, uh, I'm not gonna go through every slide in detail. Um, well, there's some people new to the class. If you uh, were not part of uh, History Theory 2 last summer, can you turn on your camera and raise your hand? Or somehow indicate? I think there's a, we have a lot of new people. Maybe use, um, raise your hand in the participant list because many of you have your cameras off for some reason. What is the, what is the raise your hand function down here? Yeah, if you turn on the participant list, um, participant. you click on more or expand it a little bit, the tools should show up. I guess more. it's more. Okay. And. Um, okay. Fingers, thumbs up, or? Yeah, something. Okay. I'm not actually in the tool. Okay, we'll fix that for next week. Um, so off we go. So it's uh, the lecture as presented last summer had these six parts. Uh, we're not gonna go through all of them. Uh, we're going to probably make it to part number four, and then we're gonna look very closely at Latin American cities because the working hypothesis of this course is if you want a clue on how to courageously face the biggest challenges that we are likely to face in the coming century when it comes to cities, 
then the best place to look is at the cities of Latin America, uh, in particular, Caracas and Medellin. And Manuel and I have been working uh, with the architects, urbanists, and politicians of the cities of Latin America since 2008, at least for both of us. And Manuel has been working with those same people since the 1980s. So uh, we have an amazing wealth of resource to pull on that is grounded in Latin America. So a lot of the questions that we posed at the end of the history theory survey sequence uh, last summer, the answers, the solutions, the clues, the more focused questions, the, 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 the hope, the source of hope that we can have as we courageously face these problems, and by we, I mean you during your careers, the seeds of the solutions lie in the solutions that are already shown to be working in Latin American cities. So if you think this course in a way is uh, a course on Latin American cities, you would be right to a large extent. So let's just go back. Let's just do swing back and cycle back through uh, where are we at here in this Anthropocene. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism, and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing we have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining, and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy, and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to nine billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Uh, Nine billion is not correct. It's 10 or 11 billion. Um, and um, one of the main themes, in, in, just in case we're being too subtle, is uh, things, uh, we use history as a way to make sense of the world. And the way we used to teach history and the way we used to teach period was uh, this whole thing of college and higher education, we invented it to reproduce uh, a passive population of worker bees who capable of uh, being competent in reproducing the systems that were already established through extractive capitalism. Uh, that 
did not turn out so well. And in case you haven't noticed, uh, everything that we've been doing, including the machinery of higher education should be called into question, must be called into question if we are to uphold our responsibility uh, as global citizens. So we no longer use education and just, you know, this is a hard thing because you've been conditioned over the course of 15 years now to uh, an industrial age uh, educational system and we need to snap out of it, you know, wake up. Everything that you have been taught is uh, subject to verification. You should be a little suspicious of everything you've been taught. The point of this education cannot be simply reproducing the operating systems that have gotten us into this mess. We need to look, use history to look at the operating system, to open it up the guts of the computer, to look at the code that is embedded in everything we do, including the formal spatial uh, arrangements of our cities and of our architecture. The operating systems of the society that produced the climate emergency and the social injustice and the oppressions of extractive capitalism are embedded in the structures of our cities and in our towns and our buildings. And so uh, we need to uh, take a fresh look and we need to be skeptical and we need to re-examine history in a way that authentically uh, surfaces and reveals uh, an understanding of the operating systems of our world, of the physical environment, so that we can understand how the operating system embedded in our physical environments uh, work so that we can then tinker with it and maybe reverse the positive and negative poles so we can do the opposite of what we've been doing for centuries. Okay, and so this is the analysis. We are not asking you to spit back to us what we tell you. We are not the most important source of understanding. On a good day, we are number four. The most important source of understanding is the world itself. And the, the second most important source of understanding is what we can see in the world, what is revealed in the world when we bring our architectural tools, our skills, our methods of drawing and seeing and writing and analysis. When we bring those architectural tools to bear, number two, on the world, number one, you have the great responsibility and power and authority to reveal things that we don't understand yet. And so in the analysis assignment, your first one is due Wednesday, we want you to pick an image that feels rich with lessons to be learned. And then we want you to dig in, zoom in, blow up the image and perform an architectural analysis. This time, instead of using a pencil, we want you to use uh, Adobe Creative Suite tools. Uh, please download them from uh, the Institute um, self-service site if you haven't already. And we want you to attack these images aggressively and ask questions. What's this? What's that? How, what's, what's this relationship between this and that? Um, why is this so different? And you draw, you, you ask questions by drawing. You ask questions by engaging these images. And then uh, whatever you discover uh, in the image, you translate it into, into a paragraph of text. And if you go back to Brightspace, you will see that uh, the first item in that 
uh, little menu is 11 analysis. Click on that. You will see the instructions for the analysis assignment. You will see this example. Uh, it's color coded. Um, again, we want you to write a caption. It should all look very familiar to you because most of you did this last summer. If you did not, if you were not part of this course last summer, uh, please ask your colleagues. The third most important source of understanding are your colleagues, your classmates. They can help. The, those who, who did this uh, 12 times last summer uh, can help guide you through uh, the spirit and intention and the details and the logistics of this assignment. Um, before we move on, are there any questions about the analysis assignment? Carrington? I have no questions. Okay, thank this you. This looks all straightforward. <laughs> to you? To me, oh. but I don't know about other people. Yeah, if they can... need help, I can give them help. Oh, thank you so much, Carrington. This is what a global citizen looks like. But um, uh, Juan, uh, Braden, um, Ludney, I see lots of new faces here. Guan Lin, well, the, the, the people all, somehow are in the course who were not with us last summer. The requirement is that they have to take off their faces and have the, show their own faces during the class. Remember you asked that last, last class. Yeah, um, if your internet is struggling to keep up, um, uh, let us know in, the pri in a private chat um, using the Zoom chat and um, um, we understand. Uh, if, if your camera's broken and your dad needs to work on it, um, just let us know. And the expectation is that we will work through these problems as best we can. And if we can't work through these problems in a given week, let us know and we'll understand. If we notice that uh, someone's face is not showing up and they're not telling us something like, um, my internet is down or it is slow or my camera's broken, then we'll contact you and, and uh, ask you if we can help, uh, if there's anything we can do to help. But other than that, um, it, it is important, it's part of the course that um, cameras be on. Um, thank you for understanding. And thank you, Manuel. Okay. So, um, this nine billion thing that the nice lady mentioned in the video, um, no, not so much. Um, for most of human history, the number of humans on the planet was around uh, between 10 million and 100 million, right? And then all of a sudden, in a sudden surge over the course of a mere 3,000 years, as seen in this graph, it shot up to a billion, one billion human beings on the planet around the time of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and now let's stretch out that scale. So now we're, if, if for those of you who are mathy, I'm going to use a logarithmic scale for the horizontal so we can see we, we stretch it out. And we've seen this. Um, and now we hit the second billion and it only took 120 years or so. Suddenly things are picking up and this is the start of the great acceleration. Then uh, it's shorter and now, boom, uh, at a steady clip, we're adding an extra billion people every 14 years or so. When Manuel was born, the human population was about one fourth of what it is now. When I was born, the human population was 3 billion, less than half of what it is now. When you were born, uh, it was the human population was 6 billion, about twice what it was when I was, when I was born. And off we go. 
here we are in 2020, we're somewhere around 7.8 billion. And uh, we often hear people say in the next 30 years, uh, the human population and the population of cities is going to grow from this to this. Don't waste your time. That is a distraction. This is the real story. During your lifetimes, the human population will peak somewhere around 10 or 11 billion. Yes, I need to update this. Uh, and um, why is it going to slow down and peak? Not because of war, death, or destruction. It boils down to education, and not just education of anybody. It's the education of girls and women in Africa and Asia. That is the reason why the human population is going to level off and um, don't bother talking about what are we going to do to uh, solve the problem of human overpopulation. Please don't waste your time, don't waste our time talking about the problem of overpopulation unless you're going to go to Africa and build schools for young women and girls, which is not crazy. One of our students made it her thesis project and uh, Jackie is probably going to go to um, Ghana and build schools for the rest of her career for girls uh, in her community in Ghana. So um, unless you're like Jackie, don't waste our time with the question of overpopulation. The focus of this course is the footprint of individual people. The, the ecological footprint of people who live in cities is smaller than other people. Cities are the solution. Living together in sharing resources, especially transportation, uh, that is uh, the key to turning back the impacts. Not population. Don't talk to us about population in the US, you're Jackie. Um, for the rest of us, let's talk about how cities reduce the ecological footprint uh, and the other measurements of the great acceleration that are driving the Anthropocene. So these slides have a lot of text in it um, and they're available to you if you want to dig back into it as part of your analysis. Um, but the big insight that we stumbled upon last summer in the process of teaching the course is the relationship between architectural projects, systems. You know, sometimes an architectural project will propose a specific design mm. that has implications for how systems work, like transportation systems or green building solutions or some systemic thing, um, racial injustice, how redlining, all, all of these things, all these systems that then have an impact on the culture. But this, this uh, little diagram operates in two directions. Uh, we are used to, the way we used to teach architecture back in the 20th century, when we were creating these problems, we assumed that architects are the servants of society. Architects can only do what the clients ask us to do. To a large extent, that is still true, but we need you to do something different than what we did. You will be under a great deal of pressure, especially in the early years of your careers, to simply do what you're told. But you can do so much more than simply do what you're told. You have to do more than simply do what you're told. Uh, that was one of the lessons of the Holocaust. Being a good German is sometimes not an option. It is not okay. Friends don't let friends simply be good Germans. Being a good Nazi is not an option. Friends don't let friends be good Nazis. And to a large extent, the culture of the architectural profession is one of simply being good Nazis. Oh, I hope you don't tell uh, Mark Mulligan I said that out of context. I hope you can put that in context. Um, 
So we have to do something different. What is the different thing? The different thing is we look at the systems that we are engaged in and we question the impacts and the consequences. And we see possibilities where people who have come before did not see possibilities. The only possibility that the designers of this new and improved slave ship saw was um, you maybe more humans will survive the middle passage if we arrange uh, the bodies below deck in a slightly improved way. That took some architectural imagination, but that's not enough. We need to use this analysis assignment to identify new possibilities that have not been seen before and offer those new possibilities to our clients, to our bosses. Okay, there's something to comment about, right? So the next part of this is let's start to look at the systems that created the Anthropocene. Um, let's look at what the Dutch did when they were facing uh, the problems of coastal flooding. These are the flood depths of the different flooding episodes uh, throughout Dutch history. And the Dutch, is, uh, uh, the, the Dutch live in a country called the Netherlands, which literally means the low land. Uh, half or more of the country of the Netherlands lies at or below sea level, even before the Anthropocene, before sea level rise, the Dutch faced um, death and destruction. These are the numbers of people who were killed uh, in each flood event, up to and including 1953, when 2,500 2, people died in the Netherlands. And so what, what did they do? They treated the landscape itself as a piece of architecture. And they redesigned the landscape such that it could protect them. And this started over a thousand years ago. They drained the landscape using windmills and dikes, and they created a set of flood defenses uh, that made it possible uh, for the Netherlands to exist as a country today. And the struggle continues. And uh, the challenges that the Dutch have faced over the last thousand years are now the challenges of every coastal city in the world. We are all Dutch now. And uh, this is an area about the size of Southern California. Uh, the size of the Dutch economy of these ring cities uh, is about the same size as Southern California. But the population distribution could not be more opposite than Southern California. Southern California is a mosaic of towns that have been engulfed by the urbanization process uh, that is the poster child of automobile dependent sprawl uh, that has swept across the continent of the United States and is currently sweeping the planet. Automobile dependent suburban sprawl is such an important transformative force that is crucial for us to understand if we are going to face the challenges of the 21st century with courage and creativity, that we are devoting an entire week to the landscape, the infrastructures, the architectures, and the mindsets, the mentality that is produced by automobile dependent sprawl. And we know that we are part of that system because how do we decide who's a winner and a loser in our society, especially here in the United States, but no longer just in the United States? We know who's a winner and a loser. The winners are driving nice cars and the losers are stuck waiting for the bus by the side of the road 
as the winners drive by. We literally define the status pecking order of human societies by their cars. And this is part of the problem. It is a culture problem that contributes to a system problem that it is responsible for the architectural projects and urban form projects that architects produce and reproduce generation after generation. The question that falls to us and especially to you throughout your careers, can an understanding of the relationship between system culture project empower you to imagine a new culture that leads to a new system that leads to a new project and then reverse engineer that. Start from the project, design a project that opens up new possibilities that people never saw before that can be translated into new systems that can contribute and apply pressure to transforming the culture. This is what architects are being called to do in the 21st century in a way that only the heroic architects of the recent past have ever been called upon to do that. Now, the key thing about the mindset is that each of these dikes is part of a chain. If you, if you live in a village and there are 12 farms in your village, then each uh, farm is responsible for a segment, one twelfth of the dike that protects the village. And so if 11 of you take care of your dike uh, and one person, one of your neighbors doesn't take care of their dike, then uh, you get flooded out, uh, you lose everything, people die. If none of you take care of your dike, it's the same. So if one person fails, you die. If 12 people fail, you die. Uh, you have to pay attention to what your neighbors are doing. This is what led to the consensus form of governance. Unless all 12 villagers agree to something, the answer is no. And so there is no standing by, there is no um, uh, deferring to other people. All 12 uh, farms, all 12 families in that village have to be full participants in the system of governance or else you're just as dead as if no one contributes. And so this is the polder mentality, the consensus model of governance. It's built into the physical systems, again there's that word systems, of the architecture and the uh, landscape itself. Here we are with a planet that is like a village. And unless everybody participates, then we're just as doomed as if nobody participates. So we are all Dutch now. And the Dutch in their systems have been able to solve food shortages. The university at Wageningen, I think I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know if there are any Dutch people in the audience. Please correct my pronunciation of Wachenken. Um, they have found an architectural solution to food scarcity and they are exporting it around the world. The overpopulation problem is locked in place. As long as Jackie and others do their job and educate the young women and girls of the world, then we're, we're done talking about population. Now let's talk about food scarcity. Here's a place where architecture can unlock possibilities and change everything about food scarcity. But it's not just the food. There are these nine zones of, uh, and it's not just about carbon in the atmosphere. There are nine different ways that the planet is being made incompatible with human life. So we have to pay attention to all of these zones and we have the tools to look at it. Uh, we look at history and the big disappointment uh, in my lifetime 
Uh, I grew up as an adolescent reading popular science, knowing with absolute certainty that when we identify problems, uh, responsible adults rise to the challenge and they solve the problems. And we did that with ozone. Um, the great, it's been one of the great disappointments of my life. And the reason why I'm so passionate about uh, teaching the course in this way is that uh, we identified the global climate emergency uh, in the 50s and in the 1960s. And by 1981, we understood it for all intents and purposes. We understood the carbon part of the climate crisis, the climate emergency, as well as we understand it now. We can quantify it a little bit better now, but we understood it in 1981 when James Hansen testified to Congress. So in 1981, uh, when, I was, when I was paying attention, uh, I was 20 years old, uh, I knew with absolute certainty that the adults would rise, led by the United States of America, <laughs> how silly and naive I was, would rise to the challenge and lead the world in uh, overcoming this problem, given all of the amazing tools we have at our disposal. Well, a moment of truth was this uh, was captured in this photo um, when the former governor of New Hampshire, sorry if you're from New Hampshire, um, uh, on the orders of George Herbert Walker Bush, sabotaged the Nordwijk summit on greenhouse gas emissions and prevented a global agreement from being signed. And here we are today. So it's going to take more. It's going to take an understanding of complex adaptive systems. Uh, these are architectural, ultimately these are architectural systems produced across entire mm -hmm. landscapes. And we will be, this pink watershed area is something we're gonna look at when we read uh, Nature's Metropolis by William Cronin, uh, the aquifers, um, feedback loops are something that uh, architects do. And um, I'm gonna maybe play this video uh, as a demonstration of how we might use game theory to understand the systems and the architecture part of how these systems work. and it can only hold this many animals. This is the carrying capacity. If animals are added beyond this, the grass can't regrow fast enough to support them all. Also, the grass protects the soil from erosion. If too many animals are around, the field may decline in productivity, lowering the carrying capacity. The animals will be less healthy and provide lesser quality products, lowering the profit each animal provides. So it's in this group's best interest to keep the number of animals on the field at or below the carrying capacity. But every herdsman that puts an animal on the field will get the direct benefit that that animal provides for them, but they would only share a portion of the cost of the degraded field. If the field were at carrying capacity and a herdsman decides to add an extra animal, the added animal takes some of the food that would have gone to the others. This reduces their value. The owner of that additional animal comes out ahead because even though all his animals are a little bit less healthy, he has more of them. But each herdsman acts under these incentives and will keep adding animals to their herd or let their animals graze longer, so long as it's profitable to themselves. But really, they're all losing out, kind of like the prisoner's dilemma. Contrast this to a situation where only one person owns it. If they add an extra animal, they're only hurting themselves, so they don't do it. Since new people can't be excluded from the field, there's almost no point in boycotting the use because someone else could just come in. None of the herdsmen own the field, and they can see that the field may not be around forever. They see no point in conservation and just try to use it before someone else does. Okay, this is the tragedy of the commons. It is a cartoon version of reality. Uh, the commons is what, uh, if, if you've ever been to New England, and I suspect you have been to Boston, there is a thing called Boston Common in the middle of the campus. And the Boston Common is a place for grazing our livestock unless they've changed the laws. But if I put too many sheep on the Boston Common, the, the quality of the Boston Common is reduced. And this is a model, uh, this is a cartoon version 
that we use in game theory for why the planet uh, is so degraded. But uh, the joke of the, uh, or the key, the punchline of the tragedy of the commons is that in order for this model to be relevant, these three herdsmen have to not talk to each other. As soon as you introduce the human system of communication and the ability for these herdsmen to talk to each other and to negotiate for their mutual benefit, then the tragedy of the commons becomes the triumph of the commons and we develop systems for common pool resource management. And I'm saying that carefully because that is an entire field of study. Common pool resource management is how we negotiate uh, the management of common pool resources to generate the best outcome for everybody and thus thwart the insidious downward spiral of the tragedy of the commons. But here's the key thing that should piss you off. If you're not already angry, look at this. The global economic system has been specifically designed to do everything it can to eliminate the key reflexive mechanism for communicating uh, degraded resources. Um, Khan Academy uses as part of their math uh, program, how do you calculate the cost you would have to add to a plastic bag in order to reduce and potentially eliminate plastic in the environment? It's right there, right in front of us. It's part of the pricing mechanisms if only we would allow the natural operation of market forces. But we don't. Monopoly capitalism has come in and corrupted governments and dismantled the capacity for economic pricing mechanisms to take into consideration the, the negative impacts of plastics and air pollution and nuclear waste and the list goes on and on and on. So it's been very specifically targeted. It's a sabotage of the, the economic systems such that we now have against all human history, we now have a tragedy of the commons acting on the planet that uh, whoever takes, whoever robs the earth, whoever extracts the most value from the planet and dumps the most pollution into the environment. Whoever does that the most, the fastest, gets the most money. Such that we now have to use all of these non-economic mechanisms to create rules and regulations and impose that on top of uh, systems. And uh, in the meantime, governments around the world are trying to simply do the thing that human societies have done throughout history. If something causes a bad impact, you simply put a price on it and you let the market forces that are producing the destruction of the planet, you reverse it. You George Costanza the hell out of it, those market forces and you create market incentives to uh, do the right thing for the planet. So that's the game theory. And last summer, we looked at Singapore as an example, like the Dutch, where uh, Singapore in 1965 uh, didn't earn its independence from Malaysia. It was thrown out of Malaysia. It, the Malaysian parliament said, listen, we can't deal with you, Singapore. You're overcrowded. You're a bunch of Chinese people, and we hate Chinese people and a bunch of communists. So we're ejecting you from the country of Malaysia. Mal uh, Malaysia uh, kicked Singapore out of the country. The island was overpopulated, polluted, was not self-sufficient on food, drinking water. And uh, the expectation was that there would be massive die-off. And, um, and we are all Singapore now. So uh, what happened was Lee Kuan Yew, the man crying on TV, 
he pulled together uh, experts. They looked at the best examples of architecture, transportation systems, urban form, among other things, social programs, education programs, social welfare programs, and they rebuilt Singapore. And now it is the miracle uh, with Moshe Safdie's uh, hotel uh, and some remarkable architecture, uh, but there's more to it than just the architecture. The architecture is the shiny surface uh, on top of a deeply embedded system and culture of using the resources and the mechanisms we have available to us to produce entirely new social infrastructures and systems to solve the biggest problems that we face today. Same with uh, public housing. We used to think that uh, the architecture was the problem um, with public housing. Um, we, uh, I'm not gonna go into this, um, but uh, except to say that, um, well, maybe I will go into it because it, it ties in with why, why, do, why does Wentworth, here's the question I'm gonna put before you before I present this. Why is it so important for Wentworth to insist that we all show up on campus for studio? Have you thought about that? Why is it so important? If you have an insight into why, please put that into the chat. Why is it so important that Wentworth, against all the evidence of uh, the third wave of the pandemic, uh, they would be willing to risk everything, uh, including people's lives, the lives of your grandparents, your parents and grandparents, probably. Um, why would Wentworth be uh, against all the evidence? Okay, so while we're thinking about that, here's another, here's a related question. Why would people want to live in Dubai? It's a desert. There's nothing there. There are no natural resources. What is up with that? And the answer is architecture turns out to be an excellent investment in economic bubbles. So these buildings are there to park investment money, not because people need to live in towers in the middle of a desert. Think about it. Boston, it's useful. People like to walk to work, especially given the traffic jams. Uh, people like to walk to work. So um, in Boston, the value of the land downtown is very high. So in order to reflect the value of the land, we build up. And, um, and the suburbs crowd around that center and there's a, there's a centripetal force pulling people to the center of the hub, thus the name, the hub. Um, but in Dubai, it's in the middle of an endless desert. So what is the upward force? The upward force is investment. If I have uh, a sovereign wealth fund, I'm the country of Bahrain, I need to diversify that fund. I can't just um, believe in the stock market because crashes happen. I have to diversify. I need to put at least one third of my money into real estate. For any of you who have inherited a trust fund of a billion dollars or even, even a paltry $10 million, uh, we strongly recommend that you put at least 3 million of your, of your fortune, about a third, into real estate just in case the stock market crashes. And so we need a tower that's 60 or 70 stories high. The, these towers are as tall or taller than the tallest buildings in Boston. And they're fully owned, but hardly anyone lives in them because we just don't need the space. It's just there for investment. Then we have this huge sovereign wealth fund. I don't want to divide it up into multiple different buildings. I need one building to park all this money. That's why this building is so tall. Not because we need any of the space, we don't, except as an investment. And every time that happens, every time a building like this goes up and we just saw the third tower 
go up in Boston. Don't be surprised if you go by it in the early evening and the lights are off because I predict people will buy those units and not live in them. And every time that happens, the exchange value of real estate in the city goes up and your rent goes up. Uh, even if you live in a, a slum apartment in Alston, your rent goes up and it drives you down the real estate food chain unless you can get a good paying job at CBT, the architects of some of these towers, uh, and start to pay off those student loans and pay the higher rent that is produced by these buildings themselves. And so this, uh, just to bring it back around to why it's so important for you to show up on campus. Well, Wentworth sees the data of pandemic deaths and new cases, but they're also looking the, at the data uh, of their financial income. And it turns out that from a financial point of view, Wentworth is in the hotel business. Wentworth is in the real estate business and as a side, as a side business to support the real estate business that Wentworth is in, it offers some classes. It hires some adjunct faculty at a one thousandth of the percent of your, what you're paying for their time. They, they are able to hire a bunch of adjunct faculty and even uh, the highly um, reimbursed uh, full-time faculty, uh, it's a tiny fraction of the spreadsheets that Wentworth uh, controls. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out that Wentworth's survival pivots around its real estate empire, which are the dormitories. So unless we can use these class meetings like studio, to generate real estate income from the dorms, then the future of Wentworth is in peril. We might even have to fire some of our vice presidents. We don't wanna do that. We like our vice presidents. Um, so we're required to show up for studio once a week. Okay, Manuel, it's time. I'm okay. gonna just say we, we looked at the Bilbao effect, just like Singapore, it's not just about the museum, it's about the long history of social, governmental, infrastructural, mm -hmm. architectural transformation of the entire city. Uh, Frank Gehry's museum was just the cherry on top of what was a much larger um, thing. And this is where we talk about reflexivity, um, that there is, the architecture is both an outcome and it's a driver of these systems. I want to share, I want to continue, I want to share the screen. Okay. So are you? Yes. It's are you working. looking at the, uh, the presentation? Uh, you need to. Uh, no. You need to. Oh yeah, no. I, I have to, and then I can take it from yours. Then. You, the one you had already. Can I can I move it from yours directly? Uh, you can request uh, remote control of my laptop. That's pretty advanced, Manuel. Well, do you want no, to try it? No, I know, I know. I just want to go directly to the slideshow. Why don't you put the slideshow on in the middle of your desktop? Okay, I, I share. I, then share your screen. Well, you were very I, close. Um. Okay. Go to Safari by using Command Tab. Okay. And move your Safari window into the the display that you want to share. Right, Carrington? This one. Now use Command Tab to go to Zoom. 
and click on share screen. Okay, and share screen here. <clears throat> and let's see what we got. And as long as we can see uh, a fragment of the Safari window on your shared screen, uh, oh. we'll be okay. So share your screen. Okay. Okay, this is a, uh, okay, this is the one I think. Yes, this is the one. So we're framing this as what are your challenges likely to be? So now click on present if you can. Uh, the one. Okay. If you click on the present button, it'll work. Present? Can you click on Where present? Where is the present? It's in, um, it's in your Safari window. Okay, I'm looking at that. Uh, Ten slides and drop us in. Yes. Share pass, capture, dissident stop video. I don't have it. Okay, I'll share my screen. And Please. You can, uh... Go ahead. Well, in the meantime, if you put the share, I can start talking about the what we're gonna we're gonna talk next about uh, about the city that Robert has been mentioning already, and it's gonna be a reflection of the late of the situation of Latin American cities, and this is a, one example of what is happening in the, in cities in Latin America, where the future actually <clears throat> happened before the present. It's, it's, it's curious because Caracas is a city that lived the future in the late in the late years of the 20th century. Okay, that the one that you had before it was okay, okay this I'm just navigating to it. So I have to talk fast because actually there are 70, there are 70 images that we inherit. And this is a, this is a, a good point. We inherit from a good friend who organized, who did a book called Caracas and Ital. And Caracas and Ital is a different look of the city of Caracas. And he uh, sponsored by the Foundation of Urban Culture who has been a sponsor of many of the activities that we have organized, including the, the Signing for Life uh, events that we have been um, organizing at Wentworth. We can have a look of a city of Caracas completely in a non-edited, completely different than the look that the people who live there have. Actually, I was born in Caracas and I lived there and I never had this image of this city from from the from the position where it, where it is now, and the the reason why I'm telling you this is because we need to see the new another phase another phase of architecture. This is the phase, This is actually this is actually the the reflection of a, a body. So there was uh, someone said once that architecture is the skin of society, and when we say that this is. This is like the skin of an, of, a, of an animal that is underground. And this is, reflects up into, into a form of a city that is the skin of that. So the skin reflects what happens, the contradictions that happen inside society. And this is, the, this is what you're gonna see. Like for example, the presence of nature, the important presence of nature so a uh, contrast in deep contrast with the expression of construction within the same space. So nature and construction are struggling for surviving in a place that is fragile from the nature point, point of view. Now, this situation in a, in a country that developed housing for the people who live there, most of the, the projects that you can see here are uh, private, but there are some areas where you have totally pro public project, you can see the lines, the separations. 
between the informal the informal settlements that develop in the hills of the of the mountain in the hills of the city and the contrast and the radical separation between the existing contrast between the existing uh, buildings that were supposed to be planned to to live there to be there and the unplanned city which you can see here and in between you see difference like this wall that separates petare norte de barrio petare one of the biggest in latin america by the way with the with the great with the areas of uh, La Urbina where, uh, where organized housing stays and, and develops in a way that is also unhuman. So we have we have a very difficult situation of both areas struggling for a place. Like you can see here with a marvelous nature, <clears throat> but with the with a very little arrangement in terms of the respect for nature and the, so we are going to work for in the following weeks we're going to be seeing how can we develop some of the strategies to to improve the quality of life in this uh, part of the in this city in particular but i wanted to show you fresh just as a reflection you can go continuous ahead with the slides robert so you can you can continue looking at the contrast between the natural elements that represent some kind of uh, protection for the city because it protects like a wall city protects from the Caribbean, which is in the other side and down below 1000 meters below you have the sea level and in the in the valley on the 1000 meters on top you have the, the city that supposedly could have been a, a really great natural resource and it's transforming into something very difficult to to have to understand you can see that this these lines all the time and this represent the limits of the great possibilities that you can have living here like or enjoying the possibilities of the presence of nature in contrast with the weakness and the, and somehow the fragility of the housing that the people do by themselves in order to in order to preserve uh, the the, lo the idea of lo the location in a place like Caracas for work, which uh, was a place that was used for work or for for uh, living for some activities. So the the city is uh, also has uh, the valley has a few connections with the exterior. These are one of the connections to the to the to the east of the city and the east of the country. So these are the, like the gateways of the valley that you can see here. This is a view from the east, looking at the, the, the dense part in the center. This is what is the, the old foundation area of the city that we will see in the next slides as well. So you can have, okay, you can continue. And some representations of the fact that nature and people are living in this permanent struggle to defend themselves, the places where you don't see housing uh, and, and the, the places where you see the, the nature as, as natural as possible is because there are laws of preservation or because there are so difficult areas to access that it's impossible to develop anything in these parts of the city. So that's why you have sometimes the, the fragility of this kind of uh, constructions, even the density of buildings that are maybe 20 floors high. And you can see them in the risk, in risk in the, in the reef of, uh, of the cliff of the city, very, very much uh, uh, fighting and struggling for permanence in the same place. And not, not to say that sometimes this housing also falls down and the, some of the times you can they can create big problems to the community by, by falling down and creating creating landslides. And so the, the, the another other entrances of the city, this is by the south. You see some of the projects, housing projects in a different scale in, in, in areas that more struggle with the with the continuity of the regional aspect. But when I was talking about the skin of the society. I was thinking in this type of images, 
by uh, Rocco in the, in, the, in the helicopter with William Nino, as I told you. They capture together some really strange views of how people's settlements develop in the territory. In this case, following the topography and the contour lines. And, but at the same time, you have to see that this piece of, this piece of uh, metal and, and construction is, is a city that is alive. It's something that is, is at the same time, the house and the home of people who live here. There are, there are kids being born in the places like this. Can, can you continue the next one, please? So there are, there are uh, people who is born in, in places like this and the, 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 the city should give the services and should be provide, provide the transportation, the movement, the opportunities, the work for these people to, to live and to, to, uh, to have the chance to enjoy life as, as anybody else. And it's difficult, but it's, it's less and less. This, this, this uh, book was for this uh, purpose was made in 2005. So already we, it's 15 years old. I wonder how this is now after 15 years of continuous development because that has continued. As uh, Robert said, the population in, in Caracas has multiplied. It, it used to be, when I was born, it used to be like half a million. It is now like three, four, four, four million. And many people has left the country because of the bad economic situation. So you have the, you have the, the struggle of the people living in this place. And, and, and the, there are other views of the same, the same avenue that you see here. And this is what William used to call the, the monumental wall. It's like a wall that separates the city, formal, the formal city to the informal city. And in, in to both, there has to be an agreement. There should be a place because the city is about, it's about agreement. Uh, it's about continuity. It's, it, the city is about the possibilities that I have can be shared with for other people that is different than me not equal than, than me. I, I don't want to be together with the equal. I want to be with the difference. You know, if I want to live in the city, that's, and you can see here that it's the opposite. The people is rejected and somehow the only possibility that they have is to increase the size of the house that somebody else in your family had. Because what happens is that all this uh, new housing that you see that depends, this is Petare, by the way, the, the old town of Petare, uh, original town that uh, developed uh, this one, and then they transform into a hill in the center of this, all his barrio, his neighborhood, is uh, the area where you find the historic center, the historic, uh, the historic center of Petare, which is this plaza right here. <clears throat> So by any, by, by all, all sides that you see, the meaning of this agglomeration of people is a struggle for survival. And you can see this, the people looking for a space, usually on top of the other. And you can see the contrast between the people looking for a space and the contrast between the city that surrounds the center and the density is basically in the perimeter, in the perimeter, it's not in the center. And we were looking, we are looking on the possibility of developing, really having the chance to give up, to give to the to the to give to the to the population the possibilities of using the center of the city to move, to transport, to have density, to have activities in order to bring the people to to that. Uh, to the to the to the to the place that now you you see also a difference between the the Avila mountain and the city with the contour the, the you can continue with this this is uh, sur surrounding the river Guayre, which here is looks like a painting it's like it it, it is uh, it is uh, the the what is left of the river Guayre going through down the hill into the into the ocean into the into the Caribbean in, in, in the east of the city. So this is the, the 
the way the river ends onto the, the sea. And you can see here the fact that several layers of housing are in different places. Like for example, sometimes the high density, you can find in the wrong place, in the places where the topography is more difficult. And you have the low density, which is this type of little houses or small buildings in places where you don't need or in places where you have more, more services like transportation, like this type of places that you have transportation and subway and you can have the subway for less people and the places where you have the higher density, you don't need, you would need more transportation and you don't have it. So con you can continue, Robert. <clears throat> so we have, <clears throat> by contrast, in the middle of, uh, of the different housing places, you have an institution like this school right here, or, uh, but you have the contrast of the different different grids and different uh, uh, grains of the city in terms of the, the, the part in having green within the, having green included in the, the housing project like this. Or for example, the, the concentration of housing that is produced by the private in the, in the case of this, this fragile zone that represent what I was saying before, the density in the top in the hills and the lower parts are less density. And uh, these are state-owned, state-produced uh, housing. So in between, this is like the geometric, the geometric forces of some kind of uh, development uh, in, in the geography, producing a footprint like this in the areas where it's not basically needed. Can you follow okay. next? <clears throat> or, or for example, examples like this uh, represent, they represent the, the existence of a house or a rich family, uh, lovers of art, and who call Gio Ponte, the Italian architect, to do their house when they got married and they founded a family. So they have the, the best place in the top of one of the hills looking overlooking 360 degrees with that house. And in this case, you can see the location of a special institutions like the, the University Simon Bolivar in the, the plane in the in the in the Esplanade. Sorry. What Sorry. is it? Got it. Okay. Is there in the Simon Bolivar University you can see the the location of the, the different faculties and schools in this one? Architecture is one of these. And this is uh, barrios getting close. To the, to the central axis of the river, where you see the river wide, it's where you have the central axis of the city. And the density is higher and the, the way the transportation takes most of the, of the space. Actually, the car, the individual car is what represents the scale of the city. So everything is designed for the car to, 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 to develop there or there. And the car usually is for is in the, for individuals, not for groups. So you end having a, a city connected by highways that don't have any characteristic for the pedestrian. And the river is dry, like canalized, like this one along the highway. In this, in the, you can see to the top left here of the slide, showing the the break, uh, the con the non connection between south and north. So the Along the whole center of the city where the communication should be better is the place where you don't have any communication at all. And this uh, organization are totally isolated. What is the relationship, uh, this what is, one, for what example, is the relationship between the United States and Venezuela? You mean in relationship in terms of... Uh, At the time of its development in the 1950s. Well, the 1950s were the, 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 the where Venezuela was rich for the oil industry, and they had the, they had the opportunity to 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 get the materials, and there was a lot of investment from the United States in in the industries in Venezuela. Yes, that was in the 1950s. Yeah, the moment when the United States was uh, after the war. So there was a very big demand of natural resources, and Venezuela provided them as well. 
and many of the richest uh, parts of the city were developed in that time. And, and the, the, you, you can still see the, the urbanization, the suburbs, especially suburban urbanization that was made with this, uh, this type of thinking of uh, high-end housing and activity. Like, like some, the stealing on the construction at this time, like this type of site that is going to be full of buildings for sure in very few, in a very few months after the after this picture. So these views from the southeast, always the Avila at the north, limiting the limiting the, the space and creating the valley. And instead, in the south, the valley transforms into fingers. So it's a totally different approach to the geography and creating these opportunities for development. Basically, you can, you, you can see this high density along the main axis of the, of the vehicles for cars and all, all that, that, explain, that explains the need of transportation, individual transportation, because the expansion of the, of the housing is very, very large. This is, a, this is a small project by an architect that we all love, which is Fruto Vivas. He, he made the, the, he made the club, the Tachira Club, which is a club house that has uh, this wonderful views of the center of the city. How much does gas cost in Venezuela? Well, it used to, it used to cost no, nothing. It used to be almost free, almost for free. Uh, it used to go uh, like the, the, the gallon used to cost like a few cents. The problem is that now everything has been uh, uh, parallel and everything has been compared. So the, you can see, um, you can see life in in Venezuela the same cost that the life in the states. The, for very few people, no, not many people have the chance to do this. And and where there is no space, the the state decided to make more space for the cars. So you can see this type of interventions. This is the Plaza Tamira. This is one of the centers of the opposition. The opposition, this is like a neighborhood that is right, in basically opposition in called Chacao. And you can see the Plaza Tamira is like the symbol of the, where the opposition meets and, and the whole struggle about democracy has been happening so far. <clears throat> so more about the, the, this is the central axis where the, the commercial activity happens mostly. Mostly, what you see here is offices and and offices and and transportation on the ground. The subway goes on the ground here, and this is a, this, the we are arriving to La Carlota, which is the airport that is kind of uh, defined the development of the east of the city in the 1950s, in 53 specifically, when. <clears throat> When all this uh, organization was developed, they left a chunk of the city for uh, an airport that originated being uh, was a private was originally a private airport. Then was taken by the military as a base as a military base. You want to present next? Okay, we will see more of the airport soon. And close to the center, you can see this uh, my major density. And the, the, the major density impacts until you get to the Jota Mill, which is this limit here. The road uh, makes the limit and then the protection areas. <clears throat> and in, in, during the 50s also, there were a, a good part of the investment in housing was made in, in, this, in, re, in housing by the public sector. And they made big, big compounds like this uh, of uh, housing for the workers. And there, there are more in recent times and there are different scales, but this demonstrated being a failure and, and this scale demonstrated being better in terms of the, in terms of the use of the space by the people. <clears throat> more of the dense, dense areas of the, East, go, going to the east in the, in the Jota Mill. But in terms of larger lessons uh, that we can draw from Caracas, in a way, 
Caracas is completely different than any city any of us have ever experienced in the United States. But at the same time, there are scenes like this that are quite familiar because uh, in the 1950s, the culture, back to the project uh, system culture uh, diagram, the culture uh, of Caracas mm. was very much influenced by the culture of the United States. So you see uh, automobile dependency based on the petro, the petroleum industry influence. Uh, there's, it's not, it's not a coincidence that some of our, our greatest baseball players in the United States mm. are Venezuelan and that uh, you see traffic jams and golf courses and suburban sprawl that this photograph could be uh, Florida uh, for oh, all. Exactly. Or the model, the basic model was actually Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a very similar, but bigger, bigger city. And you need a car to go anywhere. So you, you, you very, very rarely you, you use public transportation in, in, in the case of in the case of Los Angeles. And Caracas was exactly the same. And the influence also came because many uh, people in Venezuela wanted to go to study to the United States. So there was a lot of exchange of uh, students and, and thinking between, between Venezuela people and the uh, United States universities more, more than other countries. So the, 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 the industry in Venezuela allowed and gave uh, the, the success, the economic success of the of the of the public sector came out to produce a city that that was a copy like a copy of the American cities, and but there are some examples like this one, for example, that you see the the housing from by the state done done in the in the nineteen in the eighties with that that solution of those buildings that they they wanted to repeat to continue along the whole site. And, and they didn't do it. This was a huge, this was going to be a huge development that stopped. And there was also uh, expressions of closer to the universities or closer to the, uh, to the public housing. You can see the, the places where density was higher. Images like this is very typical of Los Angeles um, interchange uh, modes of uh, ramps and things like that, together with the housing and together with the river, parallel to the river. So this is typical density of the city in the, in the west of the, of the valley. Oops, sorry. We, we are, okay. Yes, this is uh, more, more housing. And this is the, the subway in the south, gets out of the floor of the ground so it gets elevated and you can, you can see the, the continuity of the subway to the south of the city. Again, Montalban from another angle. This is the, the abbey, the monastery, the Benedictine monastery in, in that then uh, later on went to the interior of the city, of the country side and they moved. And this is the center of the city. You can go. Oh, this, this, this also represent. This is the, the this is the old center of the city. This is the representation of the the center that was in the 1950s, the the high top, the top buildings of the 1950s, representing those those towers in the left, and then the the center grew and 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 the density exploded, and there is no distinction of where where are the spaces that wanted to be more, wanted to have more air and more openness. This is a, this is a very interesting project that we will see later in the, in the semester probably. It is by Villanueva, uh, house, public housing of the 1930s. This was the, the very beginning of the oil boom in, in Venezuela. It started to bring the possibilities of, of money to invest in housing and Villanueva, the, the best architect in the country, did these buildings with the adapting very well to the conditions of the center, which is the grid and the, the one, 100 by 100 grid. And also 
some special elements of these diagonals that happen here and bring this plaza to a, a high point. So when you see this axis, you this is the beginning of an axis that went, goes around along the city center axis and then it's play, it's play, uh, then it splits into two parts. One goes to the north east, northwest, and the other one goes to the southwest. <clears throat> and this is the cultural center of the town where you can see the theater, the museum of fine art, the Ateneum, the, the center of the activity together, of the basic cultural activities connected to the park. The same cultural activity with the high, the highest development of, uh, in terms of density of the, of the whole center area, which is the Parque Central, which is the towers that you see on the left. The two towers, the big towers representing a uh, space for the, for the office, um, public offices, and the, the slabs in the bottom were housing. And this, this compound all, to, all together allocates one, 10,000 10, families in this, in this island. And as, it's like an island in relation to the rest of the, of the city. Excuse me? As, as we look at these images, think about what we can learn from doing an analysis, even without knowing the history of the city or even where it is. What mm. does the picture itself tell us? What is, what, is this an important place at the end of this axis? Uh, and then this, uh, this strange building in the foreground, uh, right. wide boulevard, like the Champs-Élysées, ending at this symmetric complex at the end of that boulevard. What can we learn just from analyzing images like this with a architectural scale human experience in the foreground, although we don't see any people, uh, and the larger pattern of urban arrangements in the background, off in the distance, and the relationship just, between yes, as, as, as you saw before, the image of Villanueva's housing project is right in the axis. So this is the axis that starts from the Villanueva project and ends and, and ends with the teatro theater here in the in the other end. And uh, you're right, totally right. This is this is a density that ref brings you reflection and brings you to the place of how can you understand this for the future? I think there are, okay, a few more. These are the, the social housing developed by the government in the, in the 50s as well. So the, this was the, a big project that then after that was taken by more people came and, and developed the housing, the informal housing around the place. <clears throat> More, more of the avenues. This is the same, the same uh, uh, compound that we saw with, look at the, the scale and the, this is like uh, 50, you know, the, the buildings, the, the towers are like 60, 60, 60 or 70 stories high and these are like 40 or 50 story high. So you can see the density and, and, and the, the contrast between the, nature of the place and the and the quality of the design that you have in this in this uh, this place i think this is the last image robert i think so so um between now and wednesday what we're asking each of you to do is to produce an analysis uh as described in the assignment and uh in uh, it doesn't end with your drawing and your paragraph. It ends with uh, taking the multiple stages of your drawings uh, and putting them together in like a some type of slideshow that you can then create a 60 second video uh, that is narrated by you reading your paragraph. And so it's a presentation of the, uh, the image and each of its stages of development through the analysis uh, in the, the form of a video. And you will be uploading that uh, to Brightspace.
and from Brightspace during class, we will be bringing it into a slideshow. Um, and so uh, we're gonna do this every Wednesday. So every Friday we give a lecture, every uh, between Friday and Wednesday every week, we want you to produce an analysis as described in the assignment uh, and upload it to Brightspace before class on Wednesday. Uh, and the thing you're uploading is three things. You're uploading the final image with all of your analysis uh, completed. We're asking you to upload your one minute text uh, somewhere between, you know, somewhere around 120 words or maybe slightly more. And then the third thing is we want you to upload a one minute video. Uh, and uh, this is the hardest part of, uh, you know, technically, logistically, we're counting on you to help each other out to overcome the technical challenges uh, of producing and uploading the video. Um, so that's, that's one of the things. And we're gonna be doing this 12 times uh, during this semester. Uh, the first 11 times uh, we do this, it will be part of a weekly exercise. It's each one is worth 48 points. And it wouldn't be crazy to think of the first 11 being practice for doing the 12th one. So we're gonna count down from 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. And then when we get to zero, zero is your term project. This is the one, by the time you do this for the 12th time, each of you will be uh, world-class experts on how to do this well and effectively. And we want you to do that uh, as a term project and we want you to uh, get so good at it that you stack up major points um, that is worth something like five or six of the weekly um, exercises, or maybe three or four of the weekly exercises. So in a way, it wouldn't be crazy uh, to use this first one as practice to figure out how to do this well and work with each other um, Carrington and others are there to help you if you are struggling with any aspect of this. If you run into major problems, um, please uh, send an email to me and I can help out. When we get together on Wednesday, uh, we'll be all get, getting together this first week as a single class. Uh, we will um, be uh, working together um, to figure out how we're gonna do a forum discussion on Wednesdays. Um, and so you'll learn about that when we get to class on Wednesday. But right now, are there any questions about anything? The topic uh, of interest this week is the Anthropocene. If you can find an image that helps uh, you understand uh, how cities play a role in the Anthropocene, uh, the climate emergency, uh, inequality, injustice, any of these forces. Once you choose an image, our advice is to not force any message into the image. Once you choose an image, you are committed to uh, following where the evidence leads you. Uh, try not to read too much into the image. Let the story emerge out of the visual evidence itself. So not unlike what you did last summer, those of you who did that last summer, follow where the evidence leads you. Uh, that's how we do history in a way that doesn't simply reproduce the given knowledge that has gotten us into this problem. We need a fresh perspective on the world. This course, if it's nothing else, this course is a boot camp for how to figure out 
authentic knowledge from the evidence that the world is giving us independently, maybe informed by, but not beholden to uh, what the older generation is feeding you and feeding us in terms of reproducing the operating system. This is a fresh view of history. You are researchers who are doing your best together and individually to figure out the world. So don't be surprised if it's hard. Don't be surprised if uh, it pushes against some of the things your teachers, including us, are telling you and have told you. Um, new lessons are the key. That is what this course is designed to produce. That is the promise of educational, of architectural education specifically. The power of the tools of architecture are that they give us new insights, new lessons, new understandings of the world that open up possibilities that no one has ever identified previously. Questions? Okay, so um, Manuel and I will hang out after class if you uh, want to talk about anything. Uh, for everybody else, thank you so much for your patience and your Very good. Have a good weekend, all of you. We'll see you Wednesday. We'll see you Wednesday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone with a question? If you're here and you're not asking a question, we'll assume uh, that you're not actually here. You kind of walked away. Hmm. Oh, Robert, we need. Uh, I need to see the the, the assignments. Remember, you have a chance. You have five minutes to do that. Yeah. Okay. So what'd you think? Was that, let's assume these two people are not here. So I'm gonna move them, move them into the waiting room. <clears throat> Let me first turn on the waiting room. Okay. Okay, what do you think? How was that? Well, I think it was good. I think it was a lot of material that you, that uh, from the beginning of the class to the to a lot of material for them. But uh, I, I hope they express that in the reflection they have to do by thinking and writing and graphically yeah. the graphic reflection. I hope I hope they bring.